we also got to just take pause and and realize we're lucky to be we're fortunate to be seeing these performances and we might not get another one like this for a long time so talk about good for cycling Julian Ellis leap at the forefront. We all want to see the big stars do incredible things, and he did an incredible thing. This guy is just thundering, monstering this huge gear, massive amount of power. And uh, yeah, that, I think we're seeing the, the comings of a, a new dominant sprinter. In, in my lifetime, Brent, I've never seen anything like that before. Never near. I mean, nothing, whether it be Lance, whether it be Jan, whether it be Pantani, nobody, no, nobody has ever done anything like that. Welcome back to Beyond the Podium. We got a great show for you coming up today. We're gonna to talk about the dominance of today, Pagacha on another level. Jonathan Milan emerging at this year's Giro as the top clearly dominant sprinter. Julian Alaphilippe gets that mega redemptive win, the comeback of the Julian Alaphilippe that we all love, the showman. We're gonna to touch on the recently, uh, just last weekend, US national championships moved to Charleston, West Virginia. And uh, that's going to fill us up this week. That's what we got coming up in today's show. I want to welcome in Christian Vandeveld, just down the road from me, down in Greenville, South Carolina. I think you're home. I recognize your flashy bike collection there in the back, Christian. And uh, I don't think I've talked to you really since since our last Beyond the Podium episode. So uh, what's been going on and how are you doing? So everyone at home, Brent is notorious for big timing me. I called him. Actually, I called him this morning. And there, there's no callback. I mean, so this, this is notorious Brent. He's probably out on a 20 mile run, bike ride, whatever. He, I, but I do appreciate you have two very little ones. So I do remember what that was like. So uh, I got just got back from LA. Um, I did the the feed commercial, which everyone at home, I'm sorry, because you're going to be seeing that way too many times. But the, at the other time, I'm, I'm not sorry, because it's going to be awesome. Um, it was re really fun to do that feed commercial yet again, with some amazing athletes. I'm always humbled um, to see everyone out there. So that was a lot of fun, Brent. Um, but now home, just trying to get back in shape a little bit, dude, it, it goes quickly when you do nothing but sit around all day and drink coffee and bagels and then chips and whatever you want else to do so uh yeah so please one day when when you take pity on me and you go slow let's go for a bike ride i'm waiting for the day man i know we're we're long overdue i'd like to get you out in the woods up here in pisca and uh no try to make no, you make you no, squirm a little there no how much no, are you actually when you go to uh speaking of big time when you go to hollywood out there and recording those commercials <laughs> how much are you actually riding or uh is it just all that megaphone and the uh the the cut take uh showman life yeah, it was zero. I, I went to the gym for like 45 minutes just to say that I did something. But no, it's it's nothing, dude. So yeah, I, it's nice to get back and rip the bandaid off and get back into riding your bike a little bit. So but yeah, let's do this. But let's go to the first topic. We've got a lot to talk about today. A lot going on. A lot going on. The, yeah, the Giro has continued. Uh, this this big headline and the storyline there is still the same today. Pagacha just ripping everyone's legs off. Uh man on the mission just exerting his dominance left and right really that really consolidated his hold on the pink jersey and even his prime contenders Geraint thomas uh danny martinez ben o'connor they're basically just conceded that they're racing for second now and that's i gotta say a really exciting battle that we're gonna we're gonna touch on too but when we're look, talking about today pagacha and we're seeing him uh really poised for his first Gio d'italia triumph how much different is this version of Pagachar than than we saw when he won his first Grand Tour a few years ago? No, massive. Um, you know, think about first of all, that was four years ago almost. And you think about Taddy being only 21 years of age, and you think that he's only still 25, which is crazy to think, Brent, how young he still is. I think we've seen a mature Tade, but still an exuberant one, uh, an aggressive one. You think you think of what he did on Sunday stage. That was incredible. It's 19,000 feet of climbing. Just to finish those stages is absolutely brutal, as you well know. But how far away that he attacked and the, the difference he put in between first and second or first at least and the guys who were with him in general classification, not Nairo Quintana, who was actually second on that stage, was in the breakaway. It was incredible. And uh, it, it's been hard for, I think, a lot of viewers are thinking that they want to see a great race against Garen Thomas and want to be a, a, a really tight battle going into saturday's mountain stage it, it's not we're, we're gonna see here but we have to appreciate we're watching you know it's incredible to see him do these escapades we haven't seen in, in my lifetime brent i've never seen anything like that before never near i mean nothing whether it be lance whether it be jan whether it be pantani nobody no nobody has ever done anything like that um 
so it, I have to appreciate it. I remember my dad always, and I think I've said this before, um, always sit me down, whether it be when you're watching, I'm, I'm really dating myself now, watching the old bears with, you know, Walter Payton thing. Hey, this is number 34. He's the best running back you're ever going to see. You're watching sweetness. He's incredible. You're never going to see something like this again. I think, of course, Michael Jordan, obviously, I'm from Chicago. And it's the exact same thing, that we have to change our mindset a little bit. Obviously, we're not Slovenian, so we're not rah rah always Tade, but you have to appreciate at the same time what we're watching here. And it's maybe the best bike rider we've ever seen. And, you know, does his exuberance get the better of him once in a while? Yes, of course it does. But at the same time, how often do we see someone in the leader's jersey go insane from way far out when he doesn't need to, he didn't have to do any of that. And he was putting on a show for us at home. And really, I think he's racing against himself to see what he could possibly do. What are the, what are the, his true capacity on that climb? It was like him against him. It, it, there was no race. There was no race. There was never a race. You know, we, we knew almost knew this was going to happen. I didn't expect it to be seven minutes difference going into the third week of racing but it's pretty massive dude um so that's my two cents i'm, I'm gonna leave it at that well i mean i mean I, I would hope that you have the same appreciation sitting at home watching this yeah i definitely do and as a competitor I, I love it because you can see that he isn't just motivated to be the best at the giro and win the giro he's actually he's motivated and inspired to be the best that he can be he is he is really he wants to deliver that best performance and it's not just about lining up with the guy next to him and just delivering the finishing blow he is getting the most out of himself and he keeps coming back to the respect and appreciation for his team like you know these these guys this organization everyone has put so much into preparing for this objective and our other objectives to come doing anything less than my absolute best would be a, a disservice to them so yeah I, I appreciate that also as a as a competitor and i admire that and i think when we talk about those those legendary performances and iconic champions of the sport, I put that right right there with that image of him just destroying everyone, and that he's also just giving respect to the the sport and the organization that he works within, and the and the race too. I mean, let's face it, it's the Giro, the Tifosi, the pink jersey, like they love it. I, I haven't opened up many copies of Gazetta here in Nashville, but um, I can only imagine they are just, they're just making a picture and a show out of this. And that, that is also, also what the Giro is. So I agree. Like I, I appreciate some of the fans perspective and that we, we all want a close battle. We all want to see some back and forth and some pull and, and the crumbling of maybe the, the, the champion who's been leading, but we also got to just take pause and, and realize we're lucky to be, we're fortunate to be seeing these performances and we might not get another one like this for a long time so now it's not just critique them let's enjoy it as well yeah i mean is it risky hell yeah it's risky you know that, that's 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 why people don't attack in the leader's jersey when you have three minutes already or four minutes already so yeah is it risky in this race yes it's risky in this race but think about going to the tour de france and trying to do the double then it's even riskier so do you think of the, the what we've said in the past of that Tade is his only Achilles heel is that he goes ham too often, right? And you, you can't control him. If he sees the, the finish line, he puts a number on his back. He's going to give everything he's got, which is awesome. And that's why we love him. So, but is it risky to be going these kind of escapades from that far out and going deep and really pushing yourself? Because let's be honest, if he had to sit in the wheel and go mano mano, he doesn't even have to go deep. And he hates that. And I think he's like a, a scolded child when he has to do that. So he has practice a little bit of patience in a couple of the other stages um, maybe not a couple one one stage you, you <laughs> practice a little bit of that um but it'll be interesting to see what happens now that he's got you know i was saying last week i believe you know you were thinking about a basketball game you're putting 50 up on the board now he's got like 75 to zero right now going to the third week <laughs> going to the third fourth quarter so on the coast does he does he really need to do anything? No, he doesn't need to. And and he, let's be honest, man, even just riding these last, let's call it four stages that are really hard. There's six stages still yet to go to come in the Giro. The big load. It's a big load, isn't it? I mean, how many of those stages are over 13,000 feet of climbing? A lot, you know, 19,000 feet of climbing just yesterday in stage on Sunday stage. And then going forward, we have multiple stages that are over 13,000 feet and 15,000 uh, feet of climbing. So it's not easy. Um, he does have zero race. We were just talking about this a second ago off camera races on his program um, in between the end of this race and the tour de France. I mean, how, how does that go for you as far as 
not being on the bike. I'll, I'll tell you what I think afterwards. Yeah, I think, well, I, I think back to the, the first year that I ever did any Grand Tours, I did the Giro Tour Double. And um, so a completely different perspective and physiology from today Pogaccia. But I think uh, it actually, even with such limited experience and such a smaller engine, it, it did um, serve me quite well. I didn't race at all in between the Giro and the Tour. Uh, the first couple of days of the Tour, I was definitely not quite opened up lacking some of that race rhythm. Um, but then I was, I was definitely, um, coming good into the middle part of the race. So I think for him, um, with that little bit of personal insight and experience, and obviously we've all had teammates, um, who who we've seen do the past. I think, I think that's a good move from him. I think he's, he's already alluded to and touched on the the importance of that sort of psychological and mental freshness that he needs. He's going to get to go home and spend time with his family, his loved ones, um, just sort of invigorate some morale and excitement, uh, do the training rides that he wants to do and just let that Giro form, um, marinate and assimilate. So, uh, and I think, like you said, he's going to need that after the big third week, it's still, even for the fittest guy in the race, fittest guy in the world in the Peloton, he's, he's still going to need that. But you know, the signs that we're getting from him, when I watch the images of him and I see him, even even yesterday, Sunday, when he did that vicious attack and ripped open more minutes on his competitors, he's looking good. He's looking calm, poised, confident, controlled. We're not seeing him. He doesn't quite have that sort of like youthful, like bit in the teeth, just like ferocious, slobbering killer instinct that he may have had earlier in his career. Um, it, he, he, I like it. He looks he looks calculated, composed, controlled. And as you just also touched on, we did see him race the second week a little different than he did the first week. There were a couple moments when he did sort of ratchet it back and he did calculate and he really picked his moment in the second week to throw it all in to the big attack Sunday. So I think he's, he's racing smarter and smarter through the Giro. And I think that'll continue to play out in the third week. And then the, the no races between the Giro and tour is a good move. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I think the same, but Brent more or less the same. I mean, it's not easy for a massive champion who's already won these massive grand tours not to be part of the parties, everything else, but he seemed to be pretty immune to that for the most part, for the most part, for the last four or five years since he's been the best rider in the world. So I'm not worried about that per se, you know, going back to Monaco or going back to altitude camps, whatever he has to do. Um, and I think his focus already, I think he does realize that he's at the peak of his game. Like this is as good as it's ever going to get right now and to take full advantage of it. So keep that focus Stay away from those parties. Stay away from all those other sponsors who want to be a party. We have, have a, a chunk of skin out, out of Tade. So I, I, I have full confidence right now. I, I, I feel bad for all of his competitors. Um, but again, it's still a risk. You know, he's still human. You know, the, he's not a machine at all times. He's a human being. Uh, he's got feelings. He's got everything else that goes, goes a part of this. So, uh, but that said, he does look in so much control. He has such a massive lead that even if he is dying off the back he could even sit up and have a coffee in some of these big climbing days and, and still win this race overall and go home and and lick those wounds i mean when i did brent uh the giro and the tour i mean i was in the pink jersey on the first day of the giro in 2008 and then fought and i lost to the second day and it made me so upset that i was fighting for it for like 10 12 days after that and then i blew myself up so bad because i had no form to be able to be fighting with those guys up there um so I, but I put it in neutral more or less, and then did a good time trial and got top five in the last stage, but that was it. I, I was in the group head for five or six days. So it's a completely different animal than going, for, you know, for the, whatever to the podium, obviously, and especially winning. So I don't compare myself at all to Ted. And even that took me a good two or three weeks to recover from the drubbing that, that it was. And we went straight to altitude from the finish line. I think I told you that before, but then, you know, something happens like all of a sudden, like, five, six days before the tour started, I'm like, Oh, I, I could ride my bike again. And you know, everything started really clicking and you're absolutely flying. So if you, he does assimilate, there's a very good chance. And I hate to bring this up, but he could be stronger in the tour than he is at the Giro. And that's, that's a scary thought. And in fact, actually, you know, you most likely need to be stronger than he is at the Giro. And I think they're well aware of that. You know, there, there's, these guys know what they're doing. Um, they've been working with Ted very acutely over the last five years and they know exactly what his strength and weaknesses are. Um, but yeah, let's appreciate him. Um, I'm excited to see what's going to happen. He's quickly going up the ladder of most stage wins ever um, for, for current riders. Obviously Cav is way ahead of everyone by a long shot, but um, yeah, he's 
slowly but sure, surely just leapfrogging everyone day by day. So we'll see if he goes and cherry picks a couple stages without going on an hour long escapade by himself. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt it, but um, I agree. Let's let's stay focused on the Giro here. Everyone wants to quickly uh, pontificate on what's going to happen in July and Tour de France this, Tour de France that. But the Giro, it's going to be an exciting last week. And there's that really solid four-man battle for the podium. Martinez, Thomas, O'Connor. Um, and I think that's that's going to be a big show, show in the final week, too. Um, mm -hmm. So... I think uh, they were they were smart kind of in how they rode Sunday's big stage. They all so, sort of kind of said, we know we can't stay with Tade. We're not going to try to crack each other by one of us trying to stay with him. They really like man on man matched up against each other. Uh, what how do you see the final week unfolding for the the battle for the podium? And who do you have in the driver's seat in terms of those those few guys now? Real quick, before we go any farther, um, correct me if I'm wrong. They have not had bad weather, have they, Brent, at all? for the last 15 no, it's, stages it's, or so it's it's been all right um and there's there's constantly um they, i think they've evaded the worst of it yeah there's there's definitely snow up on those mountains and yeah uh lots of talk of course modifications but uh they haven't raced through the horrific giro snow that you know seems to get thrown at the riders routinely so uh, yeah so tomorrow i believe that that they might have to even modify the course because they're starting Lavinio, which is a ski resort. We saw the pictures of how beautiful that is underneath sunny skies. But when it's two degrees, what is that? 35, 36 degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit for in rain? Not nice. And so that's that's where they're supposed to be starting going downhill. So I think that they might actually either have a neutral or actually actually start at the bottom because why have a neutral and freeze? It makes no sense. Anyways, weather changes everything. You know, especially when you're going deep, deep into a race and the Giro is like no other. Is it just because of the time of the year you see people crack in the third week more than any other Grand Tour there is? I don't know what it is. I mean, I, again, I think I have to say that it is part of the season seasonality of it, apart from the snow and rain and everything else, just where it is on the calendar. And it's renowned for people just blowing up on like literally the last the second to last stage of the jury. I mean, all I could think of is Cadell Evans dying a thousand deaths back when he was in Mape, I think like 2002. And when I really thought he was going to win the whole, whole damn thing. So I, I can't call it. I don't know who it is. And that's what I love about it. You don't know when you're talking about second through fifth, who's going to be there, who's going to exceed, who's going to excel, who's going to start doing better. Garen Thomas. I've been so impressed with him. I mean, he's going to turn 38 in next week actually yeah next next week i believe he'll be during during the race itself he, he's a stud i mean as as in the old man group i i'm such so proud of him for what he's doing to be able to turn up and really how many naysayers or or lack of confidence that even his team has in him many times going to big races and he does it against all lots so g's in there in second place is awesome uh martinez looks good he looked he almost thought about going with Tade on sunday stage he did actually go for a second they're like yeah it's probably not a good idea so he thought thought, thought twice about that o'connor uh all those guys but i, I can't call who's going to be on the podium you know if, if danny does continue to do well you know danny was one of those guys that when he first came to ef he was with that guy that we were thinking oh my goodness this he's a he's a second coming of rigo or a Colombian rider coming over. He's really good time trial is pretty quick, very quick on the top of the mountain stage. So that'd be interesting to see him. But um, yeah, it's going to be a great race, not for the win, I don't believe, but for the podium is going to be a great race because like we just mentioned, ton of climbing still yet to come and with some dicey weather. Yeah, it's going to be some great viewing from my couch. <laughs> I hear that. I'm grateful to be on the couch too. And I, I think like you said, one of those guys will... We very likely see a bit of a detonation from from one of those three. I I I would doubt they would all go through the third week really evenly matched on seconds. I think the the likelihood is that one does sort of crack, and we saw that from O'Connor a few years ago, sort of at his breakout Giro. He was really poised for a, an amazing ride into the finish of the Giro, and then and then did did uh it all came apart at the end. So lots of unpredictable racing with with Thomas. Like you touched on him, I love the the professionalism. Uh, and that sort of like integrity to his own expectation, his own effort. You know, he's he's won the Tour de France. He's he was just second at the Giro last year. So a lot of fans are saying, 
what does he care about another second place at the Giro? Like, why wouldn't he just go down, guns a-blazing, chase Tade, just, like, roll the dice, even if it's a 1% chance? But the reality is, like, he's he's not only at the Giro to win. He's he's there to be accountable to himself, his team, all his preparation, and do the best ride, the best effort that he can. And I, I truly believe that he would be very proud and and content with uh, with the second place um, against the, you know this larger than life legendary ride we're seeing from Tade. So, yeah, what what do you think about the again some of the the pundits and the naysayers like come on what is what does second place even need you got to go big or go home G. He couldn't. I mean, just it's 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 matter of fact. Just pretty much what you just stated. Even if he wanted to, he couldn't go any faster up that climb. It, it didn't matter especially on Sunday stage and just to be insane and take massive risks for the sake of taking risks is, is pretty silly. Well, let's be honest. And it was seven minutes. I mean, he would have to get lost more or less on the course <laughs> for Teddy, Teddy that is to even make it. So, all right, no, I, I do not blame him for a second. The only thing I do say is like when they're pointing out that the other teams aren't taking the risk or they're only racing for the podium or racing for a second and you're doing the same thing, then I'm kind of like, wait, you know, if you're going to do that, you can't call out other people for doing that. So it's quite apparent now that everyone's in the same boat, especially the way they raced just yesterday. So what's going to happen this week? I don't know, Brent. Um, but, you know, as far as what G's done in the past, I have to say that I think that he's going to stay up there. They're really going to have to do something special and someone's going to have to go really deep to really put it to G in this last week of racing because he's been there, done that so many different times throughout his career. He's the hardest dude I've ever known on a race. He gives the best interviews. He's so matter of fact. He really just doesn't, you know, he doesn't care. I'm just going to tell you exactly what I feel. And here we are. And he's just just calm as a cucumber, just has a, that very dry humor. And if you don't know, if you ever get the chance to speak with Garen Thomas, as just a regular person, he is one of the funniest dudes that you'll ever meet. You have to take a second. You Sometimes you might walk away and realize that that was really funny. But at the time, you don't really have said that it's actually happening. Uh, but And after that, though, that third and fourth, that's the one I'm really looking forward to. You know, Danny, Danny Martinez and O'Connor. And I really, I'm really hoping that uh, O'Connor could really set the record straight for himself and really prove to himself that he could go deep on, on a third week. Um, his team looks really strong. They've been doing a fantastic job. I don't know what this team is, the Catholic AG2R. They've been such a great team this year. It's been really fun to watch. Uh, they got some stage wins. Larry Werbos, one of our buddies, one of your old teammates, American rider, has been doing a, a great great ride thus far. So, yeah, I'm, I'm pulling for those guys as well. Um, sprinters, how about Jonathan Milan? What a well, beast yeah, that dude is. Those guys, yeah, they they go under the radar on a stage like yesterday, Sunday stage. What a what a <laughs> horrific stage for those sprinters to survive. And I think every one of them that made it through are just yeah licking their wounds on this rest day. Um, but they are they are into the third week now. Jonathan Milan, clearly the the dominant sprinter of of this year's Giro, and not not just has he won one stages and been the fastest you know multiple times now, but that. I don't know. It's hard to match that sort of like just raw horsepower that we see coming out of him. He is not a Cavendish Phillipson, like real low time. It just perfectly like shoot up the inside, come out of nowhere. This guy is just thundering, monstering this huge gear, massive amount of power. And uh, yeah, that, I think we're seeing the the comings of a, a new dominant sprinter. Um, what do you, what do you think him stacking up Milan against the the rest of the, the sprinters from this generation and the the ones at the Giro? Yeah, uh, absolutely, Brent. Absolutely. I mean, it's rare that you see someone that that could actually put down that amount of power at the right point in time. You know, because a lot of times those guys are a lot bigger. Obviously, just be able to put sixteen hundred watts down after you've already been at threshold or above for the last five or six minutes going into the sprint. His team's been fantastic as well. Uh, the, the lead out that was given in his last stage win was absolute perfection. And now I'm putting him as one of the best players, just like you said, in the world going forward. I did not see that coming. I, I saw some incredible sprints that he did earlier this year, but I really thought it was looking towards Olaf Koy, um, Merlier once in a while, but I really thought Olaf was going to be the guy who was going to start really wiping the floor with these guys at the Giro just because it's such a hard race. But man, this kid, he's just so darn good. I think he just knows his body and he's got the backing. And when you see the sprinters have that momentum going, 
you've seen it plenty of times. We've all talked about Cav, how many times when he gets that mojo going, watch out. Because if a sprinter has swagger, then you know there, there's no stopping them. So if he has the confidence and he has a V12 underneath, or no, I would say he has more like a Hemi, like a massive, massive Hemi with a blower on top. That is Jonathan Milan. <laughs> that that swagger does count for a lot that you see him get it going that intangible sort of just magic that they have at their fingertips and can dish out on command if we're talking about that momentum you know you got to put them up against we're talking best sprinters Jasper Philipson and we saw him at the tour last year do the same thing it's like you get that first one just keeps rolling yeah when so I think you put those two against each other they do have a little bit different style um but I think they're they're similar in that obviously the top end speed is huge. They're both like demanding command and utilization of their team really well too. I think that that's when been one of the coolest things to watch with me for me um, watching Jonathan Milan is that that team has really rallied around him. And you, I maybe mistakenly didn't really put Trek as a a really superpower honed in sprint lead out train um, in terms of the the squad they had at the Giro or just in general but they, they clearly have stepped up to that task and they're inspired by his performance. Um, just like, uh, Jasper Philipson's team was one as well. So where do you see the, those two when they hopefully do get a chance to go head to toe or head to head a little more? Um, how do you see that battle playing out? It's going to be interesting. I, you know, if we're having that conversation at Teddy, you have to have the same conversation with the sprinters. Uh, these guys take such a drubbing in here when they go head to head at the Tour de France. Will you have the same legs? Will you have the same horsepower in the in the tour if he even comes comes to the tour? Um, so I would love to see them. You want to see all the best riders, and that's what makes the Tour de France so special. Is it's the Masters, just like in golf, where you see all the best riders at the same time racing against each other in July, and that's what really we all want to see as fans in pretty much every bike race. And so if they go head to head and he has the like same kind of form, then they're going to have their work cut out for him. And there's such depth now in the sprint field, and not just from individuals, but from what you mentioned, Lidl Trek having that lead out train. Where did that come up? These guys are fantastic. They're doing such a darn good job. And they're another team, just like we were talking about with Decathlon, AG2R. They put a massive injection of cash into that team, and they've changed 100% from the last year. They're so much better than they were just 12 months ago, not even 12 months ago. So... It's really fun to see another team stepping up. The sport continues to evolve every year with more and more teams and the depth of the riders in general. And again, how happy we are to be on the couch on this side of the fence, Brent, because it's really a, one of these golden times in cycling, I believe, to be watching right now to see how much talent, true talent coming to the forefront. Guys that might have been playing a different sport just because the cycling is becoming as professional as it is. So Trek's one of those teams, though, that that I'm psyched. We would have never been having this conversation just 12 months ago, or even a year or two years ago. For sure, we wouldn't be having this conversation about Sprinter. And let's not forget, Jonathan Milan is Italian. He doesn't really look at that Italian, but he is a big Italian dude. Um, he's the, oh, yeah, he's world record hoarder in the team pursuit, Olympic gold medalist there as well with Ghana. And he's just, we haven't seen anyone like this really talky, I guess. I mean, there's been some good ones, but the, the dominant, but of course, Chippo, of course. So having that as being Italian and winning as much as you are, like again, to the Tifosi, they're having a, a great Giro to watch. Party in Italy, yeah, for Jonathan Milan. That's a good point on the, the team pursuit background. I mean, if you're holding the wheel and pulling through with Ghana in a in a four minute effort, you know, you're, you're not just delivering a 20 second sprint. You, you've got an engine on you and some power. So I think that only bodes well for the, yeah, the, the form and continuation, the evolution, as you said, of Milan say, if we're going to talk about evolution here, um, one of my favorite moments of this last week at the Giro was this revitalized evolution of Julian Alaphilippe. Uh, yeah. you know, we, we have not seen him the past year in the, the form the uh, the spectacles that we usually see, where I became accustomed to seeing from Julian Alaphilippe, and he's been in the media. He's been taking taking heat. Patrick Lefebvre has been kind of just beating him up, kind of just talking him down. Um, kind of just yeah, had him had him under the pump. And uh, I, you know, I'm I, I've always had mixed sort of feelings on Julian Alaphilippe. He beat me up when I was still racing. He uh, he came to the U.S. as a younger rider in 2016 at Tour California when. I thought I had a shot at winning the whole thing. And he, 
he smacked around Rowan Dennis and I and, and stuck us both on second and third place on the podium. We're like, who is this French guy? And how could he, how can he TT and climb like this? Like, who is this guy? And, uh, and yeah, so he's, yeah, he, he's, we, yeah, his reputation totally precedes him since then, you know, world champion, um, not just a stage winner, but that style and flamboyance from which he's done it with historically, we haven't really got to see that much of him, but it was back on display this past week at the Giro and how he delivered that win, that, that defiance, that, like I said, that flamboyance of just letting his tongue hang out and persisting the chase. Um, that was just classic Julian Alaphilippe. And if we're going to talk about performers and showmen and entertaining that, that was as, as good as it gets. So what does that mean to him in terms of this? Yeah. This tough year he's had with Lefebvre. He's been in the Belgian media a lot. Does he come back to that team? Does he even get a ride at the tour? What does that mean for Julian? I, I, well, first of all, it was awesome. We all loved it. And talk about good for cycling. Julian Alaphilippe at the forefront. We all want to see the big stars do incredible things. And he did an incredible thing. Being out there with one other rider for as long as he was, he actually got called back by Bermati, his team director. Hey, this is probably not a good idea. And he's like, you know what? I'm going. And we've seen a lot of Julian over the last year and a half. Where, you know, a lot of times a true champion they know what to do. They know how to do it. But a lot of times their body doesn't necessarily react in the right way that their mind is working. And we see that a lot with Julian. And unfortunately, it's been rough to watch. But this one, everything worked. And I think he proved to himself that he could still do it first and foremost, because that's that's all you really need to do. You're your own worst enemy, your critic, everything involved. Forget about what Patrick says. You have to prove it to yourself first. And then, of course, your team. Now he's proven to his team. And I hope Brent that he is at the Tour de France. And if you're asking me, is he going to be a good teammate to Remco Evenpool? Absolutely. He's a guy who's out there and he'll put it on the line. He's been, he's been there before and done that before for him. So I don't second guess that. I don't second guess that he hasn't been working really hard. I know. And Patrick though, the things he says in the press is so cringeworthy and rough. Um, that's a completely different conversation. Um, but you know, then when you see what he let's forget, not forget, and roll back the tape that he did the same thing to Peter Sagan, and then Peter Sagan went on an absolute tear just to show him and shut him up, please. And did that help them? I'm not going to say I'm not going to give Patrick credit for help that helping them, but I, I, he, I don't know. It, it's it's a process, a quick step. It's a it's a family just so that everyone has their warts and their warts are Patrick, you know, and the way he's raised, but it's his team. And this is the way he does things. This is the way he speaks to the media, the media. Um, but I'm sure they still have a relationship and I'm still, there's, there's still some love there. And what we read in the papers and what we read on the internet is probably not necessarily always the truth. And it's, you know, I think Patrick has a little bit of Donald Trump in him once in a while. He just likes to, you know, entertain in his own, own different way. So I, I hope he's there, dude. I really do. I hope he's at the Tour de France, and I, I think he'll be a, a great teammate for uh, for for the, the little man, um, Remco Evenpool, and see what he could do in the Tour de France. Christian, you mentioned Lefebvre and Peter Sagan. I think you met Oleg Tinkoff and Peter Sagan, but my memory's my memory's a little blurry too. <laughs> No, 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 no. You were one hundred percent right. That is one hundred percent Oleg. So I, I think Oleg kind of wrote the book, you know, on, on really calling people out in in, in a insane way as well i mean it, it was it was incredible what he did um so yes apologies to patrick that that, that was definitely oleg who definitely was calling out peter and but more or less kind of same kind of scenario i was going for that just wanted to explain that how how he was calling him out for lack his lack of focus and training and then of course he lit it up so hopefully the same thing goes and bodes true for julian alaphilippe that he could not saying that this is the reason why he's going to go fast but he could do the same thing that peter did yeah, we, well said, Lefebvre. Not a not a guy that I would necessarily want to work for, and I, I don't. I'd like to maybe give him credit for understanding his riders at that deeper level and knowing that that's motivating him. But he does sort of just seem to to, to beat him down in the media. And yeah, what a testament of their their character and professionalism to to rise above it. I'd love to be a fly on the wall in the uh, Alaphilippe inner circle. Um, just sort of like, how do you like them apples in terms of, um, yeah, what what he was what he was saying to Lefebvre, but yeah, at that you know, at, it, at the same you know, time, I, I just still... want I just want to say before for get too far away that Patrick, I have all, all most, all most respect for him too because think about it, his team is a dynasty, you know, and they've been winning, and there's some kind of s secret sauce 
in what they do there. They whatever he brings, he he has seen the future. Whether it be a sprinter like a, a Marcel Kittle in the past, who was a good rider, and now he's a great rider coming over. And I was thinking about him actually earlier, thinking of almost comparing him to Jonathan Milan a little bit. That's the only person I could come close to thinking of of his size and stature. Um, Cav, it, it's endless. Tom Boonen, I mean, and then Yohan Museo before that. It he's always had these incredible champions and how he get, keeps everyone together. So. I just I just want to set the record straight that I'm not just going to crush it on Patrick. Still have utmost respect to this dude. Um, just just not necessarily when he's talking in the press about personal matters like that. But anyway, let's let's respect move on. the Belgian mafia. Yes, <laughs> I hear you. I'll be looking over my shoulder. <laughs> he'll he'll be coming for you. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, not to harp on the Belgians too much. Let's bring it back to the the sort of home riders, our home team, uh, the U.S audience um we got for the u.s audience we got to talk about u.s nationals that was just up uh new location in charleston west virginia another nationals on the east coast and the southeast i mean i gotta say like for most of this most of this grand tour cycling business the spring classics i'm very comfortable on the couch um and and i'm not missing it really in any way but i do get nostalgic for for nationals especially in the south um uh, it's a rare really even more so than it used to be a rare chance for these guys to come back and and compete on home soil. And I think really uh, a deserving block of, of new champions crowned. And I don't know how much you followed it, Christian, but uh, definitely some exciting racing, a pretty brutal road race course uh, in terms of profile and selection and attrition. The, the weather for the crit was just looked horrendous, atrocious at night. I don't even know how those guys could see or, or, or we're getting around really a uh, exciting racing there. So um Christian, you've seen some of these guys race, I think, at some of the the recent races in the U.S. Um, did you follow uh, Nationals at all? And and what did you think about the new Charleston courses? Yeah, the courses were, were good. There was, it was dynamic enough. It was hard enough. Um, the, the crowds weren't great, unfortunately, just so I think the weather really pushed a lot of people away. And um, But the racing was great. I mean, all the way to the juniors, watching Michael Berry and Didi's son, Ashton Berry, win the 1718 juniors race now that he's an American is he defected from Canada? Um, the time trials were great with Brandon McNulty. Um, and then of course of the triathlete winning there. That was that was really surprising on the women's side. And then of course, going to the red race, Brent, you know, it's a it's always a different race, isn't it? Since they've been able to have this in May during the Giro, who's gonna be here? Not necessarily in June when it usually is for most of the other countries in Europe. Just it, there's no real good time to have the national championships in America for the pros who are living in Europe. And I'm sure you could back me up. And you you definitely tried your hand as much as you possibly could. But it's it's not easy, is it? You're already in Drona. You're thinking about what race you have, or you're coming off a hard block already. So you're not really coming with the best form. I never did nationals with any sort of form ever. It was always an afterthought many times. So. Uh, it, it was an incredible race, though, with two EF guys and Sean Quinn taking the win by a whisker over Brandon McNulty. Um, and then, of course, Chris and Faulkner to it, just just destroying everyone by herself out there uh, in the women's race and making things right from what getting second place in the time trial. So, yeah, it was it was good race. And that and that crit, that criterion, I was just holding my breath in the rain. I just did not even want to watch it after. And especially after the crash was one lap to go. I, 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 I didn't want to watch anymore. Too much, too much. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I, I couldn't. I talked to Lawson uh, a week or two ago on Beyond the Podium, and he told us he's heading back for nationals, not doing the TT. He was going to do the crit and the road race. I was like, the crit, bro? Really? Um, so I, I haven't gotten a chance to debrief with Lawson yet, but I can't imagine uh, he was he was too pleased with this choice to to jump in that and uh, be elbow to elbow with the U.S. crit scene. Looked really, really tough uh, and sketchy. Um, the uh, the calendar debate is tough. I think as I saw it during my career, when I did nationals the last few years, there's just no good answer that you could argue that the timing it has on the calendar now is, is solid because the riders can, for, you know, potentially race nationals, um, get back to Europe, showcase the, the national championship jerseys at the tour de France. Um, but it's during the Giro. So you're missing, like you just talked about Larry Warbus, former U S national champion, uh, a horde of other good, strong U.S. riders who aren't able to do the nationals because of the Giro. So there's just no way of getting around it. I think uh, you're gonna you're gonna lose riders from the Giro if you put it back at the normal national slot for the Europeans. Then there's no way you're gonna get any of the guys doing the tour or women doing the tour 
um, showing up the nationals because they, they can't compromise their tour preparations and come back to the U S. So yeah, it's a, you're, you're compromising no matter how you slice it. And, um, yeah, the, the scheduling debate is tough and tricky. It's definitely on the, the tip of everyone's tongue here in the U S in terms of yeah, scheduled conflicts, not just across the European races, but also, um, scheduling in the U S. So something that's, I think, sort of inevitable just with the U S calendar, uh, this year was obviously um, really important for those Olympic births too. And it's, it's mm. really interesting to see, um, see that, uh, we're going to see Taylor nib, uh, triathlete racing the time trial at the Olympics. She's going to race the, the triathlon at the Olympics. And then also now the, uh, the time trial. So at, you know, my first thought, I got to admit, I saw this and I was like, oh man, this is kind of, it's a bummer for these, a woman like Kristen Faulkner, who I believe, you know, in terms of her cycling prowess and results this year, she really deserves an Olympic spot. But then I'm also looking at, you know, I glanced at the course and was reminding myself of the course for Paris and the TT. They replicated the distance almost exactly at nationals this year for the men and women. And it's not overly complicated. It's not overly hilly. Um, which they also replicated in West Virginia quite well. So you could you could argue that you know they have the best to if you're going to do a one day qualifier. It was actually actually a pretty strong move, and um, it'll be interesting now to see how it plays out with uh, with Kristen trying to get that that spot in terms of getting herself a track qualification and then being also able to um to slide into the TT as well. So lots of uh, lots of drama and and complicated uh, variables doing doing those Olympic selections. I. I I'm excited for those men and women that are fighting for those spots, but gosh, that was, uh, those were tense days. I, I know you navigated as well in your multiple, uh, Olympic births. Yeah, no, you brought some great points. You brought up, first of all, the calendar. And then of course, how hard it is with coaches selection, whether or not you have a win and go scenario, like we have here at the national championships so far away from the actual goal itself being the Olympics. Um, and it seems like there's always a little bit of drama at all times, especially on the women's side with lawsuits, things like that we've seen for decades. Um, so yeah, fingers crossed, we just get the best athletes and that's what all that everyone wants. Uh, and I think the competitors as well, just want to have the best people who could represent the country as best as they possibly can going into Paris. And that's a great point though, with the course itself, not being technical, being quite flat, not that much Hills. And if she is the best rider for that course, then so be it. It's just like you mentioned here. So this is going to be a great for her to be there and represent us. And we'll see what happens for the other spot going forward. But we mentioned with Kristen, she's such an incredible rider, um, has not been in the sport that long. She was actually in private equity and did very well at that. And then during COVID really got into cycling. And since then, Brent, incredible results pretty much every race that she's been to, maybe a little bit softer last year. And then this year guns blazing yet again and stage wins already this year. And then of course, coming to the national champions coming so close. We just mentioned the time trial, but then blasting everyone in the road race. And then the, the road race for the men's side, very hard. And especially when you look at these three guys who are off the front, Nielsen palace, do not want to forget about him. Let's go back to him. Uh, Brandon McNulty. And then of course, Sean Quinn, who took the win Nielsen though, did not get to race pretty much the entire year, Brent. He's he's had a bum knee for the most part. And to be able to come back to your first, more or less first race and have that kind of performance, that is great for him to see. And you think about psychologically how hard that had to be for him to sit on the sidelines when he had big goals and big dreams of this year. He was even throwing out some, being to some Babe Ruth with the classics and being able to go head to head with the biggest of the big with Matthew Vanderpool. Um, so obviously that that never happened. Um, that said, we see so many times when guys take an extended period of rest, not necessarily rest in the, without stress, of course, or not that he isn't doing anything, of course, he's very fit, um, but not the drubbing, the day in, day out, high intensity intervals and in racing, um, that he could be flying for the rest of the year. So if he does stay fit, so fingers crossed for Nielsen to, for the Tour de France, he could be flying. And he did a great tour last year, and I think he could do even better if he's fresher coming this year. Um, what you got to say about Nielsen and what about that yeah, to the line? Would you say, I mean, yeah. they, they, they hurt him. <laughs> yeah. Poor Brendan, man. I mean, that's what you get when you go out and blast the time trial, like he did. And you're wearing the UAE Jersey and your, your teammate Bogachar is over there in the Giro, just smacking everyone around. I mean, Brendan was a marked man um, and he was up against it, but he, he delivered. I mean, he resisted and persisted and like to even, still be in the mix. I remember doing nationals alone and just getting gang tackled by 
EF or, or in my time it was rally or human power to health. And those guys are just gang tackling me. And a couple of the years I would get to the last lap and almost be like, Oh my, I'm still here. Like, this is unreal. I'm still even in the mix. So yeah, for Brendan to, to persist through that and still be in it with a bike throughout the line was uh, man, a testament to his, um, obviously his physical level, but I love that he's, his head is in the game. And I love with all these guys, they're, they're really like honoring the, the, the responsibility to be some of the best riders in the U S and to come back to the U S showcase their, their talent showcase their, you know, their experience. Um, and also show showcase to the the other domestic riders maybe who don't get to race at the level routinely that they do. You know, it's a it's a privilege to be able to race against that and see it. Um, and every year the race also does show new sort of breakout riders that are sort of able to to um, insert themselves into the mix and and be up there with them. So that you know that doesn't happen if those guys don't take it out the, out of their schedule. They don't make the effort to come back to nationals. Um, so yeah, I, I just get excited every time I see the, you know, some of our nation's best do it. And um, yeah, Nielsen, you know, he was doing the tour coverage last year for, for NBC and Peacock. I was reminded like, this is a U.S. network. We love some Nielsen Paulus that you like Nielsen got a lot of airtime and for good reason. He was in the polka dots. And uh, you know, if we were, if we were critical of Nielsen at all, last year's tour was the same kind of thing of like almost too eager, too overzealous, like using his, using his form too much, not being as calculated. And I, I imagine it's been a very tough year with the, with the injuries, uh, slow start for Nielsen, not what he expected, but definitely a chance to sort of just, yeah, come back down to the basics, build back up again. And the fact that he showed up to nationals clearly really fit, but also with like the calmness and presence to support his teammate. He, we, we heard him in the interviews after nationals talk about, talk with Sean Quinn and say, yeah, I think, I think Sean, I think your sprint's probably better. You have a better chance. I'm going to do a little more attacking here in the final. You know, that's a, that's sort of a testament to that. He's not, he's not panicking. He's not frantic to just try to come back and get that win, get the Jersey. He feels comfortable in his place in the team. He was really proud and happy um, to be part of his teammates win. And I think he's um, I think he's the, it's the Nielsen we saw last year at the tour back on track and, uh, and on schedule for a good, a good July where he's, yeah, flashing a smile and hopefully getting getting in another jersey or two and uh, putting on that USA show, even even if he's not in the jersey that I'm sure he would have loved. Yeah, and it just again just shows the depth of these American riders racing over in Europe as well, and not too often. And unfortunately, these days there's really no opportunities to show off how good you are as a bike racer without the tour of Missouri, California, Colorado, California. I mean, it's just, it's unfortunate for a lot of these riders who are up and coming right now who don't have the opportunities that we did, Brent, when we really had a really good run at it for almost 10, 12 years, well, longer than that, actually, with California. Um, that said, they're doing a great job, incredible job over in Europe, and we have a lot more coverage than we ever have had in the past. Um, races that are being viewed from the neutral before the neutral zone all the way through the day, which we also didn't have. So you got to take the good with the bad. And these guys are really flying the flag literally in a, in a great, great way these days. So looking like a good tour de France, looking like a great tour de France, a lot, a lot of talking points, a lot of storylines going on. Um, it's just going to continue to build from here. And, and that said, it's, we're deep into May. We're not far away. And let's not forget that tour starts end of June. So uh, we had this conversation with Bob last week and I was like, wait a second, we're only like six and some weeks away. I'm like, oh my God, how is this possible? So it's hot again outside. And that means that everyone's uh, thinking about going to training camps. Taddy still needs to win pink. And then he could go to another training camp. Um, we got we got a lot of talks about this summer. How's that? Yeah. How's your, uh, how's your moto helmet and motos? Dude, man, you gonna you get your hairstyle to fit in that helmet, or what? How's it going back it, to the uh, year two on the moto? I know my my uh, it's a lot going on here, Brent. Um, that that it's probably the best thing that ever happened to me that I get to wear a helmet for twenty one days instead of. That's the reason why I have a hat on after after need after all the stages and interviews. But yeah, I'm, I'm getting ready. Um, trying to stay as strong as I can to be ready to look around my driver for 21 days. So <laughs> you're, and I'm sure you, I, I, we need to go and get you some new suits though, before the, before the, the tour Come starts. On. You, you, get, <laughs> you can't be going out there, man. The, the one suit that you got married in and wearing that for 21 days. Come on. You, you, you right. can have some of mine. I, I don't need them anymore. Send them up, bro. Take, take me shopping. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Brent. Thanks for this, dude. That's fun. 
Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Christian. I enjoyed catching up. I think we we hit all the topics. So that's it for this week's Beyond the Podium. We'll see you next time. See you, buddy. For all your cycling content year-round, subscribe to NBC Sports' YouTube page. We got it all.